This is the Bible Lesson Sermon from the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent, Plainfield, New Jersey, the United States of America, for Sunday, December 9, 2018. Subject, God, the only cause and creator. The golden text is from Psalms. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. The response of reading, Isaiah. Be ye glad, and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble. For they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. Shall I bring to the birth, and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord? Shall I cause to bring forth, and shut the womb, saith thy God? Rejoice ye with Jerusalem, and be glad with her, all ye that love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all ye that mourn for her. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. As one whom his mother comforteth, so will I comfort you, and ye shall be comforted in Jerusalem. The Bible Job, the Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. Isaiah, comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her, that her warfare is accomplished that her iniquity is pardoned. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are with young. Luke There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. 
And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John, and thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not able to speak, until the day that these things shall be performed, because... Thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zacharias, and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. And after those days his wife Elizabeth conceived. Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son. And her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child. And they called him Zacharias, after the name of his father. And his mother answered and said, Not so, but he shall be called John. And they made signs to his father, how he would have him called and he asked for a writing table, and wrote, saying, His name is John. And they marveled all. And his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue loosed, and he spake, and praised God. And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost, and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies, and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, 
For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew, and waxed strong in spirit, and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. Amos For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek him that maketh the seven stars and Orion, and turneth the shadow of death into the morning, and maketh the day dark with night, that calleth for the waters of the sea, and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. I will now read correlative passages from the Christian Science Textbook, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, by Mary Baker Eddy. There is but one Creator and one creation. This creation consists of the unfolding of spiritual ideas and their identities, which are embraced in the infinite mind and forever reflected. These ideas range from the infinitesimal to infinity, and the highest ideas are the sons and daughters of God. Spirit, God, gathers unformed thoughts into their proper channels and unfolds these thoughts even as he opens the petals of a holy purpose in order that the purpose may appear. Nothing is new to spirit. Nothing can be novel to eternal mind, the author of all things, who from all eternity knoweth his own ideas. Deity was satisfied with his work. How could he be otherwise, since the spiritual creation was the outgrowth, the emanation of his infinite self-containment and immortal wisdom? Even in Christian science, reproduction by spirit's individual ideas is but the reflection of the creative power of the divine principle of those ideas. The reflection, through mental manifestation, of the multitudinous forms of mind which people the realm of the real, is controlled by mind, the principle governing the reflection. Multiplication of God's children comes from no power of propagation in matter. It is the reflection of spirit. The minutia of lesser individualities reflect the one divine individuality and are comprehended in and formed by spirit, not by material sensation. Whatever reflects mind, life, truth, and love is spiritually conceived and brought forth. But the statement that man is conceived and evolved both spiritually and materially, or by both God and man, contradicts this eternal truth. All the vanity of the ages can never make both these contraries true. Divine science lays the axe at the root of the illusion that life or mind 
is formed by or is in the material body. And science will eventually destroy this illusion through the self-destruction of all error and the beatified understanding of the science of life. Bride, purity and innocence, conceiving man in the idea of God, a sense of soul, which has spiritual bliss and enjoys but cannot suffer. Bridegroom, spiritual understanding, the pure consciousness that God, the divine principle, creates man as his own spiritual idea, and that God is the only creative power. Mortals are egotists. They believe themselves to be independent workers, personal authors, and even privileged originators of something which deity would not or could not create. The creations of mortal mind are material. Immortal, spiritual man alone represents the truth of creation. When mortal man blends his thoughts of existence with the spiritual and works only as God works, he will no longer grope in the dark and cling to earth because he has not tasted heaven. Carnal beliefs defraud us. They make man an involuntary hypocrite, producing evil when he would create good, forming deformity when he would outline grace and beauty, injuring those whom he would bless. He becomes a general miscreator, who believes he is a semi-god. His touch turns hope to dust, the dust we all have trod. He might say in Bible language, The good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. There can be but one Creator, who has created all. The good in human affections must have ascendancy over the evil, and the spiritual over the animal, or happiness will never be won. The attainment of this celestial condition would improve our progeny, diminish crime, and give higher aims to ambition. The offspring of heavenly-minded parents inherit more intellect, better balanced minds, and sounder constitutions. Is not the propagation of the human species a greater responsibility, a more solemn charge than the culture of your garden or the raising of stock to increase your flocks and herds? Nothing unworthy of perpetuity should be transmitted to children. The formation of mortals must greatly improve to advance mankind. A mother is the strongest educator, either for or against crime. Her thoughts form the embryo of another mortal mind and unconsciously mold it, either after a model odious to herself or through divine influence, according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Hence the importance of Christian science, from which we learn of the one mind, 
and of the availability of good as the remedy for every woe. Heredity is not a law. The remote cause or belief of disease is not dangerous because of its priority and the connection of past mortal thoughts with present. The predisposing cause and the exciting cause are mental. Perhaps an adult had a deformity produced prior to his birth by the fright of his mother. When rested from human belief and based on science or the divine mind to which all things are possible, that chronic case is not difficult to cure. In proportion to our understanding of Christian science, we are freed from the belief of heredity, of mind in matter, or animal magnetism, and we disarm sin of its imaginary power in proportion to our spiritual understanding of the status of immortal being. Christian science presents unfoldment, not accretion. It manifests no material growth from molecule to mind, but an impartation of the divine mind to man and the universe. Proportionately, as human generation ceases, the unbroken links of eternal, harmonious being will be spiritually discerned. And man, not of the earth earthly, but coexistent with God, will appear. Spiritually, to understand that there is but one Creator, God, unfolds all creation, confirms the Scriptures, brings the sweet assurance of no parting, no pain, and of man deathless and perfect and eternal. I will now read the three daily duties from the church manual provided by Mary Baker Eddy. Daily Prayer It shall be the duty of every member of this church to pray each day, Thy kingdom come. Let the reign of divine truth, life, and love be established in me and rule out of me all sin. And may thy word enrich the affections of all mankind and govern them. A rule for motives and acts. Neither animosity nor mere personal attachment should impel the motives or acts of the members of the Mother Church. In science, divine love alone governs man, and a Christian scientist reflects the sweet amenities of love in rebuking sin, in true brotherliness, charitableness, and forgiveness. The members of this church should daily watch and pray to be delivered from all evil, from prophesying, judging, condemning, counseling, influencing, or being influenced erroneously. Alertness to Duty It shall be the duty of every member of this church to defend himself daily against aggressive mental suggestion, and not be made to forget nor to neglect his duty to God, to his leader, and to mankind. By his works he shall be judged, and justified or condemned.
This Bible lesson is prepared by the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent. It is comprised of scriptural quotations from the King James Bible and correlative passages from the Christian Science textbook, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, by Mary Baker Eddy. For more information, please visit our website, plainfieldcs.com. Thank you for listening, and have a blessed day.